Great, thanks very much, Mark. Um, so yeah, it's great to be given the chance to speak to you all this evening um, and um, to, to tell you that about my very personal account of the, the famous Match Girl strike of 1888. Um, I'm going to tell it from the story of the perspective as the great granddaughter of Sarah Chapman. So it's um, although there were many girls involved, um, obviously I've, I've, I'm coming from the direction of mostly one person. Um, but she was one of the strike leaders, so um, she did play a very important role in the, in the strike. So I haven't always known about Sarah's involvement, as Mark says. Um, indeed, it was only in September 2016, while I was doing some family history research, that I stumbled across this post on a forum dated way back in 2003. I couldn't believe what I was reading, as the details exactly matched that of my great grandparents, Sarah and Charles Dearman. Until that moment, I had no idea that my great grandmother, maiden name Chapman, was one of the leaders of the Match Girl strike. I had to trace Anna Robinson, who'd written the post, to find out why she'd been so interested in tracking down Sarah's family. And through the power of Google, I managed to find her, to discover that Anna had actually written her MA thesis all about Sarah in 2004, and it was called Neither Hidden Nor Condescended To, Overlooking Sarah Chapman. So Dr. Abbott, Dr. Anna Robinson, she's now a friend and she's a fellow trustee in the charity, um, she's a poet and a senior lecturer at University of East London. So at the time, Anna also discovered Sarah's grave during her research, but I'll come back to that a little later. So born on the 31st of October, 1862 in Mile End, Sarah lived all her life in the East End. She was born at 26 Alfred Terrace, which is now part of Shandy Street. And for those of you that are familiar with this area, it's just south of the Mile End Road. By the time Sarah was nine, her family had moved to Sue Swan Court, which is now the back of the American Snooker Club on Mile End Road. She'd stay here until 1891. This early map shows the two places, Alfred Terrace, the lower red ring, and Swan Court, the, the upper ring. We can see exactly where these places are today by overlaying a modern map. And you can also see here the Mile End Snooker Club. Um, so if you ever walk past it, look out for that. The, the door on the left is, is the entrance to where Sarah used to live. Sarah's parents were Sarah Ann Mackenzie, who was also a match worker, and Samuel Chapman. He was born in Hornchurch in Essex, and he was known to have taken jobs at both local breweries and the docks. Sarah was the fifth of seven children and was working as a matchmaking machinist alongside her elder sister Mary and her mother by the time she was 19. Although in rea reality she's very likely to have started working there at a much earlier age because it was common for children in those days to start working from the age of about 13 or even younger in some cases. So the Bryant and May Match Factory in Fairfield Road in Bow employed hundreds of mostly young women and girls, but some men and boys too, from miles around. It was built in 1861, and if you visit the site today, this view of the building is remarkably unchanged, although these days it's home to some 700 private residential occupants, rather than 1,400 match workers. So this is me standing outside the factory in 2016, some 125 years after my great grandmother would last have walked through those gates. So what were the working conditions like? Well, for a start, many of the workforce at Bryant and May were young, with some only six years old, and many were early teenagers. They work six days a week and often 12 to 14 hours a day for very low pay. There was also an unfair fine system that was often applied for petty offences such as talking or having an untidy workbench, being late or simply accidentally dropping matches. Some workers suffered physical abuse as well from the foreman who made sure any complaints didn't get through to the management. And on top of all of this, they had to make the matches from white phosphorus that put them at constant risk of developing osteonecrosis, which is commonly known as fuzzy jaw. To add insult to injury, if anyone so much as showed a sign of disease, they could be sacked or forced to have all their teeth taken out. 
Some factories used red phosphorus, which wasn't dangerous, but it took Bryant and May until 1901 before they finally announced they'd stop using the white phosphorus. And it wasn't until 1910 that it was made illegal in the UK. It's fairly unbelievable, really. So it wasn't all doom and gloom. So I'll share a little of the lighter side of life with you. The match girls loved the light night out, a chance to dress up and sing songs from the music halls. To give you a flavour of how they enjoyed themselves, here are a few quotes from the social commentators of the day. Clara Collett in 1886 noted that they buy their clothes and feathers, especially the latter, by forming clubs. Seven or eight of them will join together, paying a shilling each a week, drawing lots to decide who shall have the money each week. And Montague Williams commented how match girls come out very strong on a Saturday night when any number of them may be found at the Paragon Music Hall in the Mile End Road, the Foresters Music Hall in Cambridge Road and the Seabright at Hackney. They seem to know by heart the words of all the popular songs of the day and their homeward journey, though musical, is decidedly noisy. They knew how to sort out their differences too, as recorded by George Duckworth in 1897. He said, Bryant and May have a rough set of girls. There are 2,000 of them when they're busy, rough and rowdy, but not bad morally. They fight with their fists to settle their differences, not in the factory, for that's forbidden, but in the streets when they leave work in the evening. A ring is formed and they fight like men and they're not interfered with by the police. So there had been unrest previously, but sometimes workers and employers were on the same side, as was the case in 1871 when the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Robert Lowe, proposed a tax of half a penny on a box of matches, and he coined the phrase ex luce lucellum, out of light a little profit. This emblem you can see here is actually still on the wall of the factory to, to today, and there was a public outcry at the time. Everyone was affected, as who didn't use matches in those days? The management and the factory workers protested, and the picture here you can see is of the march they all went on down into London, and I think there were fisticuffs with the local police as well. So this, this actual image was drawn some years later by an artist called W.D. Armand. The bill was defeated in Parliament, much to everyone's relief, and there was a public drinking fountain erected in Bow a year later to celebrate the great victory. And as a charity, we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary of this event next year in April. Another event in 1882 was the Bright and May <clears throat> managed to deduct money from the match girls pay to pay for towards this statue of the Prime Minister William Gladstone in Bow is right next to Bow Church. At the unveiling, the girls protested by allegedly cutting their hands and marking the statue with their own blood. The statue still stands today and Gladstone's hand is still painted red as a symbol of what happened. And if you're interested and you don't know the story, there's more on this on a blog on our website, so please do take a look. There were several other occasions of strikes and unrest in the factory, but none were successful. So what was the difference in 1888? So it seems there was a potent mix of change in the air. The will and grit of the workers to stand up for their rights, combined with the social reformers who were pushing to effect change. On the 15th of June in 1888, the Fabian Society, that included the likes of George Bernard Shaw and Sidney Webb, held a fateful meeting. The actual minutes of which you can see here on the screen. Clementina Black spoke on the state of female labour, and Henry Hyde Champion reported that Bryant and May were taking over 20% dividends, yet paying their workers starvation wages. He proposed a motion to boycott the purchase of Bryant and May matches, which was passed unanimously. The next day, Fabian's Annie Bizant and Herbert Burroughs went to see some of the workers outside the factory gates to try and get the true story of their working conditions. Sure enough, they readily told her tales of the dreadful conditions, the long hours and the low pay and the fine system. A week later, Annie published an article in her weekly magazine, The Link. It was called White Slavery in London. It laid bare the terrible truth of what the match girl workers had to endure day by day. The result was a threat of libel action by the factory directors. 
who also demanded that their employees sign a document to say the link article was untrue. Well, they refused. There followed a few days of unrest that culminated in a dismissal, and that was enough to spark the flame into life. Excuse the pun. Letters were published in both the Star and the Pall Mall Gazette in support of the girls. So the Match Girls wrote this touching letter to Annie Besant, which was unsigned for fear of individ individuals being identified. Annie didn't quite understand when, when she first read it. However, its meaning soon became clear as on the 5th of July, 1400 girls and women walked out on strike. The next day, a 200 strong throng of workers marched to Bouverie Street, which is actually just off Fleet Street, to appeal to Annie outside of her office. The match girls implored her, you've spoken up for us and we weren't going back on you. She invited a deputation of three of them up to see her. And for the first time we see Sarah Chapman, um, she was one of the three along with Mrs. Mary Knowles and Mrs. Mary Cummings. And despite Annie not favouring strike action, she instead favoured reform, she agreed to help them and plans were initiated to form a strike committee. So on the 8th of July, they had their very first meeting on the Mile End Waste. Now this is an open area on Mile End Road where community gatherings often took place. These days, if you go along the Mile End Road, you'll see where the statues of the Booth um, um, couple are uh, from the Salvation Army, and that is exactly where the Mile End Waste was. Harry Hobart, a Social Democrat Federation activist, suggest suggested that they open a strike fund register. And you can see Sarah's entry here. She's number 198. MPs started to get involved with the strike as Charles Bradlaw raised questions in the House of Commons. And less than a week after the strike started, Annie took 56 girls and women to the, women to the House of Commons and a deputation of 12 of them met with Robert Cunningham Graham and Charles Conybeare MPs. By this time, a strike committee had been formed and both the London Trades Council and Toynbee Hall had started to get involved. Plus, public support was growing too. More meetings were held, and sometimes these were at Charrington's Hall. This is otherwise known as the Great Assembly Hall, and quite often they would meet in the small hall you can see right to the left of the photograph. Three letters were published in the Times that had been written by Toynbee Hall members in support of the girls, and some of the committee members took supper with Annie Besant and the London Trades Council. This could well have included our Sarah. On the 16th of July, the London Trades Council met with the Bryant and May directors to discuss the Match Girl strike demands, and it was agreed that a deputation of the strike committee could meet the directors and put their case. And so it was the next day that the Match Girl strike committee, including Sarah, met with the Bryant and May directors. Their demands were met in full and terms were agreed in principle. The strike committee put the proposals to the rest of the girls and they enthusiastically approved with warm applause and wild cheering. The next day it was in all the papers. It was a momentous victory for workers' rights and not least for women. One of the most important strikes ever was won and in just short of a fortnight. Now, Annie Besant's name has become synonymous with the, 19, with the sorry, 1888 strike, but it's right that we know the names of the courageous match girls too. We clearly cannot know all of them, but the names of the strike committee members should just as readily trip off our tongues. There was Mary Knowles, Mary Cummings, Sarah Chapman, Alice Francis, Kate Sclater, Mary Driscoll, Jane Wakeling and Eliza Martin. Ten days later, the inaugural meeting of the women, Union of Women Matchmakers took place at Stepney Meeting Hall. Twelve women and girls were elected to the committee, most of whom had been on the strike committee, and this included our Sarah, who's standing at the back row next to Herbert Burroughs. The first enrolment of union members resulted in 468 new unionists. The following week, the Link reported the following from the meeting. A break in proceedings was caused by a very kind and pretty act of the girls, the presentation of a little gold brooch to Annie Besant and a scarf pin each to Herbert Burroughs and H.W. Hobart, unfortunately absent, as memorials of the victory crown struggle. 
it would be so wonderful if these mementos one day turned up in somebody's archive. Or if the union committee here would have been prominent players in, in the making of the strike the success that it was. It was through their courage and determination. Remember, we cannot match all of the names to the faces yet, but please let's remember them. There was Sarah Chapman, Eliza Martin, Louisa Beck, Julia Gambleton, Jane Wakeling, Jane Staines, Eliza Price, Mary Knowles, Kate Sclater, Ellen Johnson, Mary Driscoll and Alice Francis. You may think I'm labouring this, but it's really important to me that we remember these girls' names um, just as much as we do um, the, the social reformers of the day, because these are the girls that had the determination and courage to make this, this strike happen and stand up for their rights. So I'm extremely proud to say that Sarah Chapman was the very first member of the new union to represent them as a delegate at a TUC event and she attended the International TUC in London in November 1888. There were 71 Union and Trade Council delegates in total at St Andrew's Hall, including only five women, of which she was one, and she attended with Annie Besant. What an incredible insight to a different world this must have been for her. Sarah may or may not have attended other conferences, but we do know she definitely attended the 1890 TUC in Liverpool. At this conference, there were around 500 delegates, but still only 10 women, including Sarah. To go away from home for a whole week to Liverpool must have been an incredibly exciting yet eye-opening experience for her. An indication of her growing confidence is that she, received, she was recorded as having seconded a motion regarding the Truck Act. This would have been close to her heart, as the Truck Act was related to workers having to purchase their own materials, which of course is what had happened at the factory and also still happened with home workers. To put into context the significance of Sarah's attendance at this event, it was only 20 years earlier that the Trades Union Congress was founded in the Mechanics Institute in Manchester, and only 13 years earlier that the first women had attended and they were Emma Patterson and Edith Simcox. 130 years after Sarah first attended a TUC, at the 150th anniversary of the TUC in Manchester in 2018, Sally Hunt, the then Congress president, celebrated the Match Girls strike and what they'd achieved. She did this in her opening address and she named Sarah Chapman. This was the first time Sarah had been acknowledged in a significant public forum and it was quite an emotional moment for me. She ended her speech using a match as a metaphor for the match girls' struggle and for their unity. So what happened to Sarah after the strike? <clears throat> By 1891, Sarah's father, Samuel, had become gravely ill. Sarah and her mother left Swan Court to live in Bromley by a bow. And by April of the same year, Samuel had sadly died. Sarah was still working at Bryan at May at that time, but by December she left to get married to Charles Henry Dearman. He was a cabinet maker from Bethnal Green and uh, as Mark alluded to earlier, he actually came from a long line of uh, silk weavers. His father, grandfather and great grandfather were all silk weavers in Bethnal Green and they were all called Francis Dearman. So Sarah and Charles had six children, three of whom predeceased Sarah. First in 1892 came Sarah, who was later known as Elsie, and she died as recently as 1985. Then they had a son, Charles, in 1894, but sadly he died at aged only 10 days old. Two years later, another Charles came along. He fought through both world wars and became a policeman, but he died of his war wounds in early 1945. William was next in 1898. He was my granddad. He did outlive his parents, but was still relatively young when he died at the age of 60. Sadly, I never got to meet him, but we believe he served in World War I and was a lifelong West Ham fan. The youngest daughter, Elizabeth, died of leukaemia just 12 days after her 21st birthday. Finally, there was Fred. He was born in 1903 and he died not until 1984. As his mother before him, he was a strong trade unionist. Sarah's Charles died in 1922 and she spent the last 23 years of her life in Bethnal Green. 
Unfortunately, we have few tangible links to Sarah's life apart from a few photographs. However, we do have some memories via my dad, Ken, who recalls Sarah giving him a red train engine when he was three or four years old, which would have been about 1941 or two. He drew this engine for me from memory. He also recalls visiting Sarah, who was his grandma, of course, in a terraced house in Bethnal Green, and he went into a dark room with an aspidistra in a large pot, with antimacassars on the chairs and the evocative smell of gas from the glass wall, wall mounted gas mantles. We also have a very special wooden box made by Sarah's husband, Charles, who you'll recall was a carrot cabinet maker. When he died, he left this to his son, my granddad, who for the rest of his life would keep all of his important papers inside it. He in turn left the box to my dad, who's now passed it on to me. It's such a special treasure to have, especially knowing that perhaps Sarah may once have held it. So following on from Anna Robinson's earlier discovery, I refound Sarah's grave in January 28, 2017 in an unmarked porpoise plot at the Manor Park Cemetery in Forest Gate. It's threatened with mounding. Sarah's husband Charles and two of their children, Elizabeth and baby Charles, have already been lost to mounding. The cemetery keeps no record even of where, where, where they were in the grounds. We have a petition, so please do use the link to sign up and help us. We have successfully raised funds to get a proper headstone for Sarah, thanks to GMB and Unite Unions, but it could be years before we can put it in its rightful place. Eventually, we hope that we will be able to find the graves of all the committee members of the Match Girl Strike, so we can ensure they all have fitting tributes. So just to let you know a bit about mounding, it's a brutal process that involves removing all headstones, levelling the ground with JCBs and adding new soil. Once the soil is settled and compacted, some three to five years later, new burials are made. This involves digging into the existing grave plots and risks disturbance of the remains. It also means the locations of the graves are lost forever. <clears throat> We're campaigning to ensure that private cemeteries have to operate under the same regulatory laws as municipal cemeteries. So only three miles east of where the Streatham Society meetings usually take place, this is at 39 Colby Road in Gypsy Hill, there's a local connection to the Match Girls strike via Annie Besant. Following her separation from her clergyman husband, Frank Besant, Annie moved here in 1874 with her daughter Mabel and her ill mother, Emily. While she was here, Annie earned money by writing, and in that same year she gave her first ever public lecture that was later published as The Political Status of Women. Annie was introduced by a neighbour of Colby Road to MP Charles Bradlaw, who she would go on to become very good friends with. Years later, you will, so you, sorry, years later, you will recall from earlier in the presentation that he actually spoke up for the Match Girls strike in Parliament. This plaque was actually put up by the London County Council in 1963, and you can see here on the modern day map that the, uh, the Gypsy Hill is very close to Crystal Palace. The road is st still there today. So after hearing this wonderful story of what a humble girl from Stepney achieved back in 1888, you may understand some of the reason for my deciding to start a Match Girls charity to honour Sarah and her fellow workers. I would just like to give you a brief introduction to who the Match Girls Memorial are. We were established in March 2019 and we're dedicated to commemorating and memorialising the victorious Match Girl strike and raising awareness through the education and the arts of the amazingly brave and courageous girls, hundreds and hundreds of girls and women that stood up and fought for their working rights. As you can see, we have an amazing team of people working with us to achieve these aims, the pinnacle of which would be to have a statue to honour the Match Girls in the East End. Our patrons, ambassadors and trustees represent trade unions through to women's rights, to the arts and education. It's unbelievable, given the influence of this strike in subsequent years, that there is no public memorial to the Match Girls. Our charity is now determined to raise funds to permanently commemorate their brave actions. There's a woeful lack of statues to women in the UK, as can be seen by these alarming statistics from 2018. The situation has improved slightly since then when Millicent Fawcett's statue was erected in Parliament Square. 
We've also seen since 2018 Emmeline Pankhurst and Lily Parr in Manchester, Annie Kenny in Oldham, Emily Wilding Davison in Morpeth, Nancy Astor in Plymouth, Elizabeth Frink in Coventry, plus Mary Wollstonecraft only last week and Mary Seacole in London. But we still have a long way to go to redress the balance with white male leaders, angels, royals and naked nymphs. The ultimate aim is to get a statue, but we're also investigating murals, mosaics and street namings. Another aspiration our charity has is to recognise each of the strike and union committee members by arranging commemorative plaques for each of them, either near their birthplace or in the area that they grew up. We already have an active campaign for a plaque in Southampton, my hometown, where Kate Slater was born. Of course, we'd love to commemorate every single one of the workers, but it's just impossible. It's actually quite a challenge just finding out enough about the committee members. Um, we've got our work cut out there. So in March 2020, to mark the strike on International Women's Day, supported and funded by Unite again, we arranged to send awareness ribbons to every MP and hundreds of peers. Ribbons were worn during both the Commons and the Lords debates, and the match girls were mentioned in no less than seven speeches. Ultimately, we would love to have the names of the Match Girls Committees read out in Parliament on International Women's Day annually to recognise their contribution to Labour history. Last but not least, we're keen to raise awareness of the Match Girls story via our website through collecting descendant stories via education and the arts. And we're keen to work with local schools and community groups to provide drama and art workshops. And we recently launched our very first competition to encourage a new generation of poetry, flash fiction and even film to share the story and inspire people from all walks of life. As an example of how the Match Girls and the Strike have been immortalised, in around 1940, Robert Mitchell wrote the very first known play about the strike, The Match Girls. He performed that at the London Unity Theatre. His assistant, Helen Dibley, who carried out the research, spoke to survivors of the strike. The play has lead characters called Kate and Sarah, so it's quite possible that they spoke to the real Kate Sclater, by then Kate Furnell, and Sarah, by then Sarah Dearman. Sadly, his papers were lost in the Blitz and he drowned in 1942. To find those archives would just be amazing. Bill Owen's later, late 60s musical also had a Kate, and we're currently tracing archives of an, yet another 1960s musical, Strike Alike by Joyce Adcock, which has a lead character called Sarah Chapman. No other Match Girls character in the plays have surnames, so it's intriguing to know why she chose Sarah Chapman. Recent examples of how the Match Girls have inspired present day artists are Lem Sisse's Sparkcatcher's poem, this was commissioned for the 2012 Olympics and it's now on permanently on display at the Olympic Park. This in turn inspired young composer Hannah Kendall to write a piece of music of the same name, which had its world premiere at the Royal Albert Hall in August 2017, played with the Chinake Orchestra. And then there's London artist Laura Green and his artwork. <coughs> he entered this into a London Transport Museum competition and got into the finals. So here are the links to our current live campaigns. If you've enjoyed this talk, please do support us wherever you can. I'm sure uh, the, these links can be shared with you afterwards if you're, if you're interested. Above all, we would be very grateful for your opinions and ideas about the statue and memorials. We'd love to hear from you. You can give us your views by visiting our website and either directly submitting a feedback form or by emailing us. If you simply want to follow our progress, do sign up to our, our mailing list or follow us on social media. Thank you so much for your time this evening.